Hello, and welcome back. I'm going to be making a glass pumpkin today here on the Matt Yasa channel. And so I'll be starting off here today with a 40 millimeter by five millimeter borosilicate tubing. I'll be flame cutting it in half using the Bethlehem Bravo torch. And I'm gonna keep the footage in real time. That way I can demonstrate how long a process like this takes. The tubing was also at room temperature. I didn't preheat it in any way. I chose this heavier walled tubing as it could help me blow out a larger pumpkin. And now this is only my second attempt at a pumpkin, so it's a work in progress. And larger objects usually do take a bit longer on a torch. This project is a little better suited for the traditional methods of glass blowing, working with the furnace and glory hole. And I don't have that kind of uh, equipment in my shop, but someday I do plan to have both a furnace and a torch. And if you're interested in seeing what that would look like, I would recommend the Corning Museum for Glass. They just recently uploaded some pumpkin video. I don't have my work up yet, but if you are looking to purchase a glass pumpkin, I definitely recommend them. It's a museum dedicated to glass based in Corning, New York. I've never been there myself, but I really do want to take a visit down there someday. All right, and now it looks like this tubing took about a minute or a minute and a half to flame cut through. I didn't pull it apart too much. I wanted to gather it up a bit to blow it out like this. I'll go ahead and open up a hole on the end to attach a blow tube. I'll blow out an extra thin bubble and rip it open in the flame. And so I still need to make a nice sturdy rod and tube holder for my desk. The first one I made wasn't heavy enough and it kept falling over when I use heavy tubes like this. I might place it where the glass scale and the water wheel are and move those somewhere else. They've been there for a while now. If you haven't seen those projects, make sure you check them out. I do have a lot of cool projects in the past that I've done on my channel. But now for this project, I'll use my jacks tool to flare the tube a couple times. This will give me a nice taper and a nice round hole. I'll open the end of this 12 millimeter tubing also to flare it for a hot seal connection. The blow tube will be used as a handle to hold the large tubing along with a channel to blow into. This is a common technique for scientific lamp working. The other method is called pulling points in which I would heat the large tubing itself and pull it apart to create the handle. However, I don't practice that method very often. And when I do pull points, they are usually very thin. And so I've always trusted in the hot seal technique for heavier weight projects like this one. And now I want to heat up both surfaces very hot, very molten to a nice liquid state and put them together in the flame. And I might need to spend a little bit more time heating up the larger tube with that extra thick wall. After I attach them, I pull apart a little bit to help create that funnel. And so I want to pull more of the tubing out and less of the blow tube because it's pretty thin already. I'll hold it in the flame a few extra seconds also, more towards on the heavier tube side 
You can see that thick ring of glass getting pulled out into a funnel or a taper. And now I'm gonna flare open another blow tube to attach to the other side. And whoops, I end up dropping the tube and smashing it on the floor. I'm definitely thinking of working on that tube holder here this week. But now I wanted to show you what the glass debris looks like. Being borosilicate glass, it is a little more stable. And so it tends to break in larger chunks. And so you can see the majority of the large tube is still intact. And so I'll just have to remove a little bit of glass from the end to straighten it up for a blow tube attachment. But then you have to be careful for pieces like this one. Not only did it break with a very sharp point, but the shape of it causes it to point upward when it falls on the ground, kind of like a caltrop. And so you have to be careful not to step on them. But besides that, you actually don't get as sharp edges for borosilicate as you would soda lime glass. And here is the majority of the small particulate debris. You have to be extra cautious with the glass dust. You don't want to breathe that in. So you want to avoid sweeping that dust up also. A safer method would be to spray it with water and wipe it up with a paper towel. And so I'll go ahead and start working on some new blow tube attachments and restart the project. Accidents happen. You got to keep going and not let it slow you down. Unless it's been a little bit of a longer day and you start making a few extra accidents, then that's usually a good sign that you might need a break. And so I went ahead and funneled in some orange frit for the pumpkin color and some of this yellow striking color. It should strike and change into a range of yellow and reds. And so I'm hoping that secondary color will give me a little bit of texture and just not a straight orange. I'll go ahead and mix it up and put it in the kiln to preheat the tube and the frit inside. And now with the frit warmed up, you can see it's changed to a kind of darker brown color. And this is just temporary as it's just glowing from the inside. And now as I start to heat up the tube and rotate it around, it will begin to stick to the inside wall. I'm going to try to do one section at a time and get a nice even area stuck with frit. And then I'll go in with a very hot flame and try to melt all that frit in. It's good to get it completely melted in on the inside so it's nice and smooth or else it could lead to cracks later as it's cooling down. And now I'm gonna go ahead and try to tap any extra frit out that may not have gotten melted in or stuck in the blow tube. And it's looking good. I like to do that before I blow into it so I don't have any frit coming back into my mouth. But now I'm gonna heat it up one more time and give it a starting puff. And the inside wall is still pretty thick. I put a lot of frit in there. And now I don't use frit as often. It is something that does take a little bit of practice. However, it can be a very vital tool for those looking to get into production. It can be a quick and effective way to add color to your work. But now the more traditional method of applying glass frit, especially with the furnace work, would be on the outside of the glass. They basically lay it on a fireproof table and roll the molten glass, the gather, back and forth over the frit to pick it up. And that's when they'll put it back into the furnace through the glory hole to reheat the gather and melt everything together. And so it works a little bit like an oven. It heats the glass from all directions all at once. Where lamp working is almost a little bit of the opposite. We work at one direction at a time. 
And so it's more detail oriented work. For the next episode, I will be doing a smaller, more detailed project. Something more suited for this torch. So make sure to hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out. It's always great to get new subscribers here on this glass adventure. And then of course, if you're enjoying the show, you can always hit that like button. Make sure to share this onto your favorite social feeds. That way your family and friends can enjoy the molten mysteries of what is lamp working. And so I'll go ahead and begin the shaping process here with my very versatile butter knife. A lot of artists do tend to improvise with their own tools, especially with the sculpting and shaping process. And now again, they wouldn't use this method particularly for furnace working to make a glass pumpkin. Instead, what they'll do is use a special star mold, which has several points, eight or 10 of them. They can use that to get a very quick and uniform shape. But now instead for this one, I'll have to just go around and make each indention at a time. And so when you're working around a sphere or a tube like this, you kind of have two options to go. You can work at it one area next to the other, kind of like a clock going all the way around. Or what I'm doing here and working one side at a time and then going to the opposite side. And it might depend on what the shape of the glass is in or the pattern you're doing. But I prefer to heat the opposite sides back and forth. If you allow one area to get too cold, especially with deep gouges like these, it might begin to crack. And so it's a good idea to remember to reheat your work, either in the flame or in the kiln. A nice even heat all the way around. And so one thing that is pretty important when you're trying to sculpt or replicate something in glass is to have a actual copy of what you're trying to make. So I was trying to recreate this from memory, which can be a bit problematic at times, especially when it comes to proportions. Certain features that you're trying to recreate might not be quite in proportion to what it really is. So for example, if you're making a bear, you'll make the body too small and it'll look like a dog. Or you'll try to make a fish and the fins are too large and it looks like a bird. And so for the pumpkin, I couldn't quite remember what the grooves on the sides look like. I thought they were a bit deeper than what they actually are. And the stem, of course, was green, but it was a bit angular, too. I couldn't quite remember what it looked like. And so a picture or the actual object nearby is always best to be able to look back at. And now I'm just doing some last minute corrections, some of the lines that might need straightened or continued and blown out a couple areas that got a little too deep. And now I'm gonna add some green frit into a separate tube to make the stem. And as I do, you can actually see a lot of glass dust coming out. And that's why you have to be extra careful when working with frit. It may cause some long-term lung damage if you breathe it in. And so I'm going to get things started up again with my glass candle. It's a miniature oil lamp with an all-glass wick. But now I wasn't sure how to get this frit melted in. I figured I would just try the same thing as the first tube. I'll have to be much more cautious being such a small tube as it would be very easy to melt it together and close it up. 
And so you've probably noticed my new Baby Yoda shirt. That was the other birthday gift I got this year from my younger niece. And she's too young to have watched Star Wars to know who Yoda is, but she does think Baby Yoda is very cute and loves the color black. So I can totally see her picking this one out. And I wasn't sure how it would look on camera, but now that I'm looking at it, it looks pretty good. I think the colors match really well with the background. And so you might have seen all that glass debris, which they call bubble trash. It was definitely not intentional. I was meaning to blow out a thin bubble and rip it open in the flame. But I put too much pressure into it and it ended up popping. Thankfully for the ventilation system, it pulled it all away from me. But now I thought I would share a story with you of something else that got pulled away from me, which happened this weekend. And so it was a pretty nice day out. I took my nieces down to the park. I brought along my trusty Frisbee and a boomerang. So I purchased the boomerang a while back before I started lamp working when I had my old job. It was kind of an impulse buy. You know, I've always wanted a boomerang. But then I realized I have no place to throw it. There's a lot of trees and houses around. And then every time we go to the park, I kind of forget about it. And so I thought this time would be the time I'll take it out and get some practice. And so I threw it about four times trying to get the hang of it. It was starting to curve kind of well. And my little niece thought it worked more like a Frisbee because she's never seen a boomerang before. I said, no, let me show you how it works. And so I went and I threw it as hard as I could. And it was flying, and it was spinning, and it started to curve, and it was going right for a tree. And I was figuring, oh, that's okay, I'll just hit it and fall right down. But no, it hit the very top of the tree and gets stuck. Real quick, I had to pull a little bit of glass out to blow a hole open. I'm going to attach the green stem, and that's going to be the top of the pumpkin. But now for the boomerang, I was pretty disappointed that I lost it being only the fifth throw. But then as I'm looking at this tree, that's when it hits me. This is no ordinary tree. This is the same tree that ate my favorite kite 25 years ago. I remember walking back to the park after school like every day for a week looking for that kite. And so I wasn't going to let this tree take my happiness again. I'm going to climb it and get up there and get that boomerang. It was one of those hard to climb trees too, like no very low branches. I kind of had to bear hug my way up there, but I did it branch by branch, got to the top, and I was able to just shake it loose. But once I got it down, I realized how nice it was up there. It was a bit of a windy day, so the tree was just swaying back and forth, kind of like a boat in the middle of the ocean. And I know you're probably thinking to climb a hundred foot tree to retrieve a boomerang sounds pretty crazy. Uh, but you gotta understand back in my day, the internet wasn't quite as what it is now. It was in its infancy. I mean, we had the Nintendo, of course, but other than that, climbing trees was my main source of entertainment. It does get a little bit different as you get older. I do have a little more reach, but I do have more mass, so I have to be careful and go a bit slower. But now for the pumpkin, I'm attaching the stem with a nice, good hot seal. This blow tube attachment will be another handle and give me access to the inside of the pumpkin so it's not closed off. I'm going to remove the other blow tube in my left hand and finish out the bottom. And so I do like pumpkin flavored things, but I've never cooked pumpkin myself. I do like to cook. I make a variety of different things. It's usually a bit cheaper than getting fast food and it always tastes a bit better too, a bit more fresh. And you can also customize it however you like. I always hated the notion that you have to prepare a food in a very certain way or 
top it with a very certain ingredient or condiment. Like, let's say you're over at my house and you would like some ketchup for your fine steak. Then I'll just go grab the ketchup. You know, it's your personal dining experience. It should be what you want to enjoy. I can grab the ranch too if you want. Maybe put a pickle on top. But now to get to the bottom of this pumpkin, I'm going to make sure it's nice and flat and also concaved. I did that by holding it upright towards the ceiling and allowing the bottom to fall inward towards gravity. And so you can see that nice concaved dome on the inside. You can go with a flat bottom, but the rim does help stabilize it a little bit, especially if it's a messy table. And now I'm going to remove the blow tube, which is attached to the stem. I'll leave the top of it open. This way it doesn't become a pressurized vessel in the kiln and possibly explode. If I were to close it up completely, the air inside would expand during the heating process, causing a positive pressure, or it would contract during the cooling process causing a negative pressure, which of course could cause the vessel to explode or implode. And now I don't necessarily know how much pressure the glass can take for something like that. Just for safety, it's a good idea to avoid it. Closing up a vessel. But now I've got my claw grabbers attached to the bottom of the pumpkin I'm going to finish up the stem. And as I said before, I failed to bring a pumpkin into the shop or a picture of one. So I'm doing it from memory. And I forgot what the stem looked like exactly. I just remembered it had a lot of angles to it. And I thought it had a curve too. Maybe I'm thinking more of a cartoon pumpkin. I don't know. And now I'll put it in the kiln at 1050 Fahrenheit and anneal it for two hours. And then I'll let the kiln run through its program so it can slow down the cooling for a few hours after that. But now here it is out of the kiln. And it's looking pretty good. It's got the right colors and a bit of texture to it. The shaping might be a little bit off, but other than that, I think it was a very informative episode. There's going to be some more intricate details in the next episode, possibly some moving parts. So make sure to tune in again here on the Matt Yasa channel.